I want to welcome everybody to Friday's edition of Recovery Live today. I hope you guys all had a great week. Uh, my name is Tom. I'm a recovered alcoholic from Came to Believe Recovery, where we make sick people healed and healed people powerful. Did I get that right, Sean? Good job. Nailed it. Exactly Nailed it. Right, Father. So uh, today we're um, going to be talking about workplace addiction. And my guest today is Peter Roselli. He's actually a neighbor of mine. Me, I could almost throw a rock and hit where Peter is. We met uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and Peter comes to us from uh, the financial district in Wall Street and has had a career in finance in New York City, has some great insights into addiction in the workplace and in the high finance of New York City. And Sean Higgins is with us as well this week again. Sean, uh, as a business owner too, has a lot of insight into workplace addiction and the issues that come with it, along with uh, a mastery of the Came to Believe Recovery program. I want to take a couple of announcements, guys, today. Sean is actually running our first on-ground retreat in a year. Awesome. Where people will leave saying they are recovered, as we yeah. see. Um, we are so excited to be back on ground, having our message delivered in person, face-to-face, -face, the way it was meant to be. We're right. looking forward to bringing more retreats as the summer goes on into the fall. We're coming back, guys. In the meantime, we still got our virtual events going. Next weekend, March 19th through 21st, is our next virtual retreat, VR10. Can you believe we've done 10 virtual retreats since the pandemic started mm -hmm. with complete success? It was just nothing we thought would happen. Mm -hmm. And then there's one in April too, uh, the 9th, 10th, and 11th. So there's two and the registrations are open if anybody uh, is interested and wants to sign up to get free. Uh, at our retreats, guys, came to be recovered. Some of you that haven't been on our program before, uh, what we do at the retreats is we take you through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous just the way the founders did it back in the 1930s. We have a connection that came to believe right back to Clarence Snyder, who was sponsored by Dr. Bob, who was uh, one of the founders, him and Bill Wilson. Clarence Snyder took some of our founders through their steps, and he started these retreats that we run 50 plus years ago. So we didn't just come out of this yesterday. Mm -hmm. We've been around the country and now around the world with this life-saving message for over 50 years. Just recently is when we've decided we've got to take this thing even more global. And Sean has joined us and Peter here is today to help us uh, uh, talk about the problem and help with the solution and start spreading awareness even greater than before because there is a solution, right, Sean? Oh yeah. And I want to, I just want to address something quick because there's nothing I love better than correcting you live on Facebook. And while we let the other people join, no, it's not so much a correction, but Tom is right that, you know, we're going back to the founders, but we really find our roots in the Midwest founders, you know, the Akron, Ohio group, the Cleveland, Ohio group, uh, not so much in the New York founders group of it all, but, um, but we're carrying on that legacy of, of Dr. Bob, Clarence Snyder and the good old timers. But here's the deal. I got one complaint, Tom. We need some intro music. I got to get jacked up on this thing. You know, I'm coming in hard. And if we don't have like that pumped up, like, you know, where, where is it? Where's the intro music? I got Tim Anderson working on it. He came back from maternity leave. The poor guy gets a little break because he had his a baby. He's our marketing manager and our wizard behind our, our effects. We're going to have it by next week, I think, Sean. Awesome. We're going to have some intro and some outro stuff. So we know we want to bring that up. Uh, God wants us to be uh, doing everything with excellence. So we're going to do it, brother, buddy. Well, if he needs some like B-roll footage of me dancing, just, just let him know I'm available. I can shoot it myself and send yeah. it to him. He already said he does not want B-roll of you dancing. Okay. Well, his loss. Maybe the world's not ready for it yet. It's not, it's not ready for it. But so what do we do at these retreats, guys, right? We do what the founders did is we took people, we take people through the steps quickly. We take them through in a weekend, in a weekend, you don't think we can do it? We can, and it's what they did. As a matter of fact, there's tons of evidence that Dr. Bob took people through their steps in an afternoon and set them free. When you're ready, the answer is there. We tell you that you're gonna do steps one through nine once, one time in your life, and then you're gonna do 10, 11, and 12 every day, practical tools with a set of principles that, are, uh, that underlie this whole thing that everyone would agree are tools that 
would be beneficial to anyone in life. Things like being honest, being unselfish, having a pure motive and doing everything in love. Who could say those are bad principles? And they all happen to be Christian principles that underlie this whole program. It all comes out of the Bible, our program. I know, Sean, it's, it's shocking that people know. But Alcoholics Anonymous and, um, had its birth through that. The founders were in a Christian Bible study before they wrote the book. So the principles underneath it are all those principles based on that. And so the, uh, the power comes from an all uh, powerful, creative, intelligence in the universe, which is what our big book says, but it's God, we know, and it's the God of the Bible. And when you get a personal relationship with him and you work through this program and you use these practical tools, you are set free and you will call yourself recovered. Mm -hmm. The book even says, I was reading this morning, it says, we feel a man is unthinking when he says that sobriety is enough. And we say the same thing. We offer you a fourth dimension of existence, guys that is beyond anything that you could imagine. You're gonna hear Sean and Peter and, and I today talk about the life we lead today. Oh, by the way, we don't drink and we don't drug, but what we have is a life that we could never have predicted before. And that's available for you. If you wanna challenge us on it and we're wrong, all you did was waste a weekend. But what if we're right? And this thing can set you free. Yeah, It is a life like you can't imagine, right, Peter? I mean, can you imagine, can you imagine today, back when you were in your addiction, that you would could have this kind of freedom? No, in fact, I was saying back in those days, there was a song by Neil Young, yeah. and the tagline was, it's better to burn out than it is to rust. So we <laughs> used to joke, you know, we, you know, I hope I die young because I don't want to rust. It's just this big, you know, wrong way of thinking. So I don't think I could have ever imagined that I'd even still be alive when I was in the depths of my uh, drug usage and alcohol. So yeah, you're right. And, and it really feels like every day you start by just saying thank you to be alive and healthy and not have the uh, police knocking on the door. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, well, let's get to our giveaway and then we'll get into our conversation today. I think it's gonna be really, really interesting and very enlightening and it affects all of us. Um, so today, um, Sarah is our wizard behind the screen, and she will <laughs> she will pick a random viewer uh, who will get the I Am Recovered shirt. So once she picks that random viewer, she'll let me know on a text, and I will announce it, and then you can send your address, and we'll send that to you. As usual, uh, at the end of the show, we'll do the End Addiction shirt. Uh, next week, I think we're going to have some other things that we're going to give away. we got some other neat stuff for you. So as soon as Sarah lets me know, I will announce it. So um, like I said, my guest today is Peter Roselli. Uh, Peter is, um, I can let him introduce himself in a minute and give us a little bit about his background and what brings him um, on our program today. And we're gonna be talking about uh, workplace addiction and all those things that come with it. All right, here's Sarah. Jessica Sanchez wins the shirt. Hey, Jessica, send your address to Sarah and we'll get that shirt right out to you. Perfect. So Peter, why don't you give us a little background on where you came from and how you're sitting here today so ready to help us share this great message. Yeah, I, um, like I said, very grateful for the opportunity and the connection here and hope to be uh, increasing our connection and helping more people. So. Uh, Oh, I'm in northern New Jersey, close to New York City. That's where a lot of the Italian immigrants uh, came uh, in the early 1900s. That's where both my grandparents came through Ellis Island and uh, were just hardworking people that barely spoke the language when they got here. So I saw a lot of real big work ethic, but I was a um, pretty good athlete. I ended up getting a, a scholarship to play football in college, but I was also partying. And uh, because we were so close to New York City, we could go into the city easily and get drugs and bring them back and sell them in the high school. And, you know, it was way too much, too fast, not mature at all about how we were handling our lives. And, you know, it was kind of a double thing for me because being an athlete, they don't normally party that much. Um, so it was all an attempt to just be accepted and, you know, frankly, a lot of really bad intentions of what, of what to do, you know, with women. But that was the game I was being taught. 
that that's how you had you know more status in in the group I was growing up with. So it wasn't a question of whether or not we were going to do drugs and the people I was hanging around with. It was just you know whether you were going to get caught and you know how well you played that game, which was all deceptive and you know and all lies. And everybody thinks they can handle it and, until they can't. And, and you're usually, uh, you know, under a truck somewhere, you know, hoping somebody gets the, the jack and, and gets you out from under that bus that you got hit by. Um, and those are some tough lessons to learn. And I didn't really learn them until I was much older, 25, you know, compared to high school. I didn't stop until I was 25, which was 1983. January 1st uh, is when I made a decision I wasn't going to go back to it. And... Uh, have it, you know, so that, that, that could only be a supernatural gift because I didn't have the willpower to do it. That's for sure. And, uh, I knew, you know, that first step of you have to acknowledge that you're not in control of your life and that you need, you need help, you know? So took, took a good, honest look in the mirror and recognized, you know, if I keep going on the trajectory I'm on, I'm probably not going to be alive because I was doing such risky things. And, you know, you think you're better at the game and you think you're fooling people, but I wasn't. And it was getting very dangerous where I was. You know, I know people have died for what I did and I didn't. So I was just grateful that, you know, I got a second chance, really more like a 200th chance. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, I never, you know, knowing that I always wanted to try to help other people know that there's a way out that it's not as hopeless as it feels when you're stuck in it and and that's been you know very rewarding part of my life you know that 12th step of going out and helping other people without jamming them without you know forcing it on them or making it look like you're better than they are nobody likes that you know nobody wants to feel like you're lecturing them it's more about you know one person to another who can relate to the things that other people are dealing with and Give them hope, you know, just a ray of hope that this is not the only option on the menu. Right. So let's fast forward to today and let's fast forward through your experience in your career, you know, sure. on Wall Street and some big firms that you've worked for and some, right. you know, you've had quite a career in the New York City area. And as you said, you've kind of had it be kind of an avocation or a mission of yours to help and work with anyone that has addiction problems because you got out of it, right? So it's yeah. something that you're very you're very interested in. Let's before we talk about uh, you know some of the barriers. What how bad do you see the problem in in New York City and others in like the financial, the Wall Street world, all of this? Right. How bad is the problem? Yeah. So I mean, there's a lot of functioning people that you wouldn't know. Are, are dealing with an addiction because they've learned how to cope, um, but it's bad. You know, there's a lot of pressure to produce. And, and you know, Wall Street's not that much different than other industries. It's just that it's known that if you're very good in that field, especially in sales, that there's basically an un- unlimited amount of money you can make because they're very complex deals that they're working on. So if one big business wants to sell off a division to another, it's no different than the real estate market, right? If you're in real estate, you make a commission on the sale. So if you sell a bigger house, you make a bigger commission. Same thing on Wall Street. You sell somebody's business, you get a big fee for that. And then you become known as the guy, the rainmaker. And then you get put on the next job and the next one. So there's all this attitude and survival mechanisms. There's competition. There's people trying to take your job. And there's pressure. You're on a tightrope all the time trying to meet your family obligations, and then still meet the work obligations. In one of the big banks, they actually had to change the swipe cards so they wouldn't work after midnight because people were working so long that they were afraid, you know, that they were, actually there was a couple of suicides because the pressure was so high for them to get there. And, you know, you can understand why somebody would want to take an accelerant. So that, that might be the gateway drug in the door is, you know, not caffeine, I promise you, there's other things <laughs> that can keep you awake longer. And then, you know, like, it sounds good until you crash. And then, you you, you know, you're, you're just a miserable person when the drug wears off, right? So there's a lot of mask wearing. There's a, there's a lack of transparency and, and authenticity. And you're playing a role in order to meet an end. And we're not meant for that. We, we're meant for honesty. We're meant to be able to live in community with each other and just be honest, like a good football team would, right? Everybody knows there's different skill levels, but we're all on a team. 
corporate America has lost that in, in many ways because it's just each person for themselves. And, you know, there's a lot of really, you know, uh, high achieving women on Wall Street in, in every field, right? It's not just men. And, and they're just as prone to, to give in to what I would call a counterfeit affection. It, it's something you think is going to work for you, but you find out later it was a lie. It, it, it didn't didn't follow through on all the promises you thought it was making you. And it's really hard to make up for that lost ground. So, yeah, I think it's a big problem. Counterfeit affections and using controlled substances to uh, try to implement or I'm sorry, augment your skills is a bad idea. So I think it's really interesting. I think there's a perception, Peter, that you're crashing today that um, smart people and wealthy people don't aren't susceptible to addictions and the problems of addiction. And that's just not true, right? Um, I would say you know, they probably have more ego and pride. And if anybody would say, well, I don't have a problem in that area. So it's where the IQ could work against them right. and, and where the competition, you know, look, you know, like all these Ivy League schools where many of these people went to school, they were, they were already like the chosen kids in their county or their state or whatever. And now they get into this bigger pond where there's a lot of other people that are just as smart and they're not used to that. So whatever I can do, you know, to augment that, to increase, amplify that. So I look better, right? It's just so shallow, but look, that's, that's the reality of, of our existence. I have one client that said, I love my boat until I went out on the bay and a bigger boat came by and then I hated my boat. Wow. So you never win that game. You know, so, I mean, this should affect all of us, too. I mean, these high, yeah. powerful people that are in Wall Street and even in our government and around that are dealing with addictions and the issues that, listen, that that were bothering us, there a lot of them are handling our money, you know, or our pension funds or things in our organization. So to get healing and to get health, uh, mental and, and emotional and spiritual health and into the people that are managing the money and the finances of our country and in the world is, is something we should all be concerned about. So I think any effort we can make. So Sean, on the other end of the spectrum, you're not on Wall Street. Your business is a moving business out in Wisconsin. But is it any different with workplace and the addiction problems that you see at your level with your employees? Well, I got some. I got a question for Peter. First, is what's the uh, what position did you play in football? That's huge. I mean, we need. I'm the Packer fan. We got to know that. What what you got? What did you have going on? Ray Nitschke, middle linebacker. Oh, nice. So you you lay the smack down. <laughs> <laughs> you know when when Pete. I know there's. I I was fortunate enough to be able to go to Hazelden, and when I got plugged in, um when I first got sober, it, it didn't give me what I needed. I eventually went to Cane to Believe Retreat to get the final cherry on top of it. But when I, when I was there, there was all these people that were like high level people. There was an anchor man from a, from a news, uh, a news channel, local news channel. And then like, you know, I hear you talking about these wall street uh, people and they, they hit this bottom, but like they made a lot of money. Like they had a family, they had a house. And I always kind of was jealous in the beginning, like, well, you know, because I was rock bottom. I had nothing. I had, was homeless. I didn't even have a car or a job. And I'm like, why couldn't my addiction have brought me to that place, you know what <laughs> I mean, instead of the where I was? Right. But, it, you know, it, at the end of the day, just like you're saying, it don't matter if I'm at rock bottom uh, with nothing or rock bottom with everything. Rock bottom is still rock bottom. You know, it's still you still hate yourself. You still want to commit suicide and all that oh, good crazy worse. stuff. It, it, in some ways, it could be worse because you were expected to win the game. So yeah. you, know, you checked all the boxes of every, that everybody wants, and you still didn't win, and you're at rock bottom. So you know, there's just all kinds of self-loathing that you know that people find themselves in when they don't meet up to the other people's expectations. So yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. You know, it, it's bad either way. Rock bottom is rock bottom, and you got to hate it enough to say I'm doing. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to stop. I can't do it on my own. I need help. Yeah. And you said, you know, you, you thought you, you thought you could win the game. And, you know, that's just like me last week at Buffalo Wild Wings on the Blazing Challenge. I thought I could do it, and I couldn't. I paid the price. So Many burps later. <laughs> yeah. I still today, I'm not on my game. So <laughs> what was the question, Tom? I'll, I'll answer it, and I'll stop being goofy. Yeah. Yeah. Um... How do you what what how do you see the problem in, in your industry with as as far as addiction when it, people that work for you or you know what as opposed to where 
you know, from the Wall Street point of view? I'm dealing with a lot of entry level um, employees. You know, you you don't you don't grab you don't sit at uh, uh, the table with your parents when you're younger and say, when I'm older, I want to be a mover. You know, there's no shame in it. It's a, it's there's a lot of careers like that that you end up finding. Uh, finding out you really enjoy and can make good money at and, and pursue, but it's not like the dream job. So I, you get a lot of people who are either young and trying to get a, a leg up in life or, or have been kind of beat up by life. And a lot of those people do have drug problems. And the sad thing is, is for what I see is you see a guy come, he starts to do really well. He starts to look a lot better. He starts to really excel at his job and he's finding purpose in his job. And, and in the end, the purpose isn't enough to keep them sober and they disappear. And then they come back, you know, a year later and, and they do it all over again. And it's the, it literally, there's a cyclical pattern. It's, and it's like the, you, even though it's been 20, 30, 40 people that I've watched this cycle happen with, it's the same person every time it happens. So right. that's what I noticed for addiction and, do you find that they might get an injury, like hurt their back and get some meds, and then that, that can open the door too? I mean, I see that a lot here with construction workers. And, you know, it started out as a way to have to keep working. So I had to deaden the pain in order to just do the job. And then they end up getting addicted and alcohol, opiates, you know, whatever the thing is, so they can sleep at night. You know, it's just another one of those traps. It's a trap. So when we talk about this, so there's some statistics, you know, 75% of everybody with a substance use disorder, which would be alcohol or drugs or whatever, is active in our workforce today. So this is our discussion. Sean is saying they're coming to work for him. They're coming to work for Peter. They're coming to work on Wall Street as active. They're not, you know, that stigma that everybody is, uh, you know, a homeless person uh, that's an addict is absolutely untrue. Right. It's they're amongst us and it costs us in, in emotional and in human terms, it's hard to even put a price on it, but we can put a financial price on it. It's like $81 billion a year in the US, just addiction in the workplace, lost in productivity and absenteeism. Another 7 billion pounds in the UK, my UK friends, if I don't say pounds, they get me, in, I get in trouble. On our text and we do have a couple of great questions coming in so as soon as we get through this i have some good question for you peter coming up um and um so that that statistic let me give you this put it in perspective in 2019 of the 150,000 substance use disorder deaths 102,000 of them were employed so they were working when they died and i know i didn't lose my job right till the end peter didn't lose his job right at the end i don't think no and Sean did towards the end, but then came right back into the workforce. You weren't out of the workforce very long. Right? Well, no, and like, listen, I'm an addict. Like, I yeah. need money for drugs. Like, so to, to lose yeah. the money is a stupid yeah. thing to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, and today, um, we know with COVID-19, substance use disorder has gone up. 13%, 18% increase in opioid. And I think those are conservative numbers. And I think what we're gonna see, um, is a big wave. Peter and I were talking about this a little bit before we went on, that as we start to open up again and people come out of kind of hiding in their homes, there's going to be a, a real outpouring of need to, yeah. uh, to battle addictions that have been able to kind of gurgle underneath while everybody's at home. Uh, if you look at the sales of alcohol during COVID, it spiked right. tremendously. Yeah. And that was how people were coping with being alone. I have a cousin uh, through marriage, a relative through marriage, who's a police officer in a large urban area in New Jersey that's known for you know, drug use. And he arrests many people driving through with nice cars that present well, that are professional, educated people, that not who you would think, and including heroin. You know, like people think if it's a heroin addict that they're strung out somewhere. No, they're still able to function as hard as it is to believe. And uh, so, look, you know, it's an equal opportunity destroyer, I like to say. <laughs> so I have a question. Uh, all right, I'm going to start with this one. So, Peter, this is comes from one of our um, one of our uh, audience members who says that she was a successful businesswoman in London and nearly died. Her alcoholism fueled was fueled by trying to compete in the 90s 
Man's World, the mm -hmm. 90s Man's World. And she heard you mention about successful women in alcoholism and addiction. Yes. So um, can you expand a little bit on that, on your yeah. experience with women and the issues? Yeah, I'm old enough that, you know, when I graduated high school, it was still a man's world in, in the finance area, at least. So, you know, I watched the whole evolution of women being accepted into the marketplace and the, uh, you know, if the pressure's strong uh, on a typical man, you know, under the normal scenario that I saw growing up and my parents were, my mother stayed home and raised the kids and my father worked and was the provider and, and they were able to do that. You know, they didn't live above their means, but we had a good life. But then all of a sudden there was a lot more people entering the workforce and people coming in from overseas in the 80s and 90s especially and the pressures could you could argue are even harder on a woman who's trying to also have a family at home and a professional career and trying to keep up with people that don't have that second obligation about raising the family at home mm -hmm. so i mean one you know you hate to say speak in general terms but in general women tend to be very good relationally and men tend to be a little bit more uh, the engineering idea let's get the work done and and women are very good at the at the social skills and communicating with each other and those skills are very valuable in the workforce right so they're also you know good at multitasking men are typically unitaskers right i don't want to get in trouble for sounding like i'm making just blanket generalizations but they're all positive things these are all good things except when you're trying to juggle so many things in the air at the same time that something has to give and, and often it's your social life where, you know, the real authentic relationships that you have friends that will tell you, hey, I'm a little concerned about you. You're working too much. You're losing the balance in your life. And, and now it's just looking up to that next person in the, in the firm and saying, well, I could do that. And then I'll be able to make this much money and then we'll be able to do all these great things as a family. Except that that treadmill just keeps, keeps getting turned up faster and faster. And before you know it, you have to use something to keep you going. Just can't keep up. So, do you think um, what when when um, when our our viewer um, is expressing that she uh, felt like she really had to try to keep up with the men? Did you feel absolute. like that's an absolute reality? Absolute, absolute reality. And worked with super successful, talented women, and don't think there's really any difference gender-wise and when it comes to competence you know a woman can do just as good a job of, uh, as a man in a white collar field like maybe better not, sometimes yeah not on an oil rig yeah. in north dakota probably wouldn't be the best place to compare but in, in a white collar business absolutely that's what i said the people skills now that the computers are doing so much more of the grunt right. work it's the people skills that really matter and look again you know there can be stellar people in either gender but women do great in law firms wall street you know very successful ceos of big corporations one of my clients spent many years as ceo one actually i went to high school with her super successful and not an addict to my knowledge unless she's hiding it well so it's not a given that they'll become addicts but they are there Right. And the, I mean, you know, it's just been unfortunate and, and just the way it has been historically that it's been kind of a man's world in that finance world, but it's changing now. The women have, have moved up. I mean, there's certainly no legal barriers to it and there shouldn't be any corporate barriers, right. of course, to, to women being equal. But I, I can see where they, that um, she has a real experience Absolutely. The that she was trying to felt like she had to compete with the men. So I think that Women today, as it's getting less and less, still have that extra pressure. And you're right, the whole family thing, uh, uh, that they may have that extra pressure too. And even, um, so, huh. Well, yeah, and then, you know, it's a whole other conversation to say whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, it doesn't matter. It's it's a thing now and, and thing, we right? have to deal with it. And, yeah. and hopefully, you know, be able to talk to each other about it. If it is starting to overheat in a certain area, nip it in the bud, have an accountability group, and they do that well, I could say, on, uh, on Wall Street. They, they allow people to gather around different affinities. Mm -hmm. uh, so that part, you know, they are trying to build community. So we do have a question from um, one of our UK um, attendees as well. I'm going to hold off on it for a minute, and that's from Terry W., because I want to get into a little part, and then we'll get back to it. We're going to talk about the solution a little bit, because now we've been talking about the problem a lot. 
so we can start talking about the solution and what it is that got us where we are today and how do we get this message to those hurting and suffering right. on wall street and and working for sean and everywhere in between mm -hmm. so what do you see peter as some of the barriers like a, an, an organization like ours came to believe recovery right in our name we say came to believe which could be a turnoff for somebody but came to believe recovery we want to bring this message of of hope into everywhere right. not just where we are now we want to we want to expand and be able to what would you see as a barrier of us being able to be um effective in a wall street environment well the northeast is uh, known for being a little skeptical you know if you go on times square where all the tourists go there's always somebody selling a watch you know, they open up their jacket pocket and they got all these fake Rolex watches. And so like out here, at least people start by thinking you're running some kind of scam. And, you know, like, like what's in it for you? They don't really believe that you care about them. They think you want something from them. So the best way, in my opinion, for people to understand about came to believe is through relationships that don't have any agenda that you know, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care kind of thing. So take somebody out to lunch. Don't start by saying, hey, I noticed that you come in on Monday morning and you're hungover. Do you have a drinking problem? <laughs> Probably not the best place to start. How about, hey, I heard you went to Miami and I did too. And why don't we go to lunch? And we probably know a lot of the same people. Or I looked on your LinkedIn profile and I noticed we have a lot of similar friends uh, maybe we can grab lunch one day and, and then they know, you know, because you do sincerely care about them. Mm -hmm. It's just that if you jump right to, I've got your answer, like what, you don't know me. Like, you don't, you don't have my answer. You don't have your own answer. If you think that's the way to talk to me and, and, you know, I'm sorry, but like, we've all seen people now when you walk in a restaurant and there's a family sitting at a table and all five of the heads are down working on their phones in a restaurant. Like they're not even talking to each other. So you're, you're, we're losing that human touch of like, how, I don't even hardly get any phone calls anymore. People text me right, for right, right. I'm like, just call me. <laughs> like, we're losing this. And you can't read somebody's feelings in a text, right? I know it started out as just kind of a courtesy, hey, do you have a minute to speak kind of thing, but went way too far. So just the fact that you're saying to them, can we go grab a bite? I'd like to hear more about your story, right? They're not used to that. They're used to the person being a competitor instead of an ally. So yeah. that's a great place to start. Just do the, the normal, like friendly things and then listen way more than you talk, right? You got two ears and one mouth. Do you think those are the same, um, a, a barrier? Do you think that's the same approach that for people for you, Sean? Well, I like to consider myself and, and don't jump on me before I let me finish my whole train of thought because right off the bat, I can already tell Tom's going to pounce on me. But I like to consider myself like glitter because uh, glitter is the herpes of craft. Like it never goes away. Like once you break out the glitter, it's uh, if you have kids, we were just talking about grandkids before the show. If you have kids, you know that glitter, when it enters your house, it's everywhere. Um, and I like to think like every interaction we have with someone is to just let a little bit of what you have stick to them. And, and you do that in a way of just being authentic and real transparent and, and, and reaching out and loving like he, like, like Pete's talking about with taking people out to eat, but you get so far down in your addiction that you start to think that the way you think is normal, you know, like yeah. I had this thing of like, I'm just going to eat a cheeseburger a day. You know, that's just what I'm going to do because then I'm not an addict if I'm at least eating. And then you start to think like that's normal, but it's completely not normal, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, that's the same way it ends up getting sometimes when we accelerate to this higher level, we start to think that the way we think now that we're healed and recovered and, and on top, we start to think that that's how a lot of people think. And, and it's really not either. There's a lot of people stuck in the middle of both either rock bottom or where we are today. And, and to give them a little bit of glitter, I, I, when I get a relationship with people, I start to use language like, this is going to stick with you. And one day it's really going to hit. And one day you're going to remember that I said this and it's going to matter to you. That's a, that's one example of, of, of how I try to be like glitter. But another one is just to, like, you know, you have, we, you have no idea how much it means to someone to go up to an employee or a coworker and say, you know, I really believe in you, man. I've been watching you. 
and uh, and you know you you might not you might be like how do you believe in me but i used to be kind of uh where you were or i used to you, you know i've been seeing some similar patterns and some other people i follow and and i believe in you man you're gonna you're gonna do great you're gonna do really good and i'm glad i'm on your team or i'm glad you're here you know those little things start to stick and then they pay attention to you and eventually you know my favorite thing is when people say what is it about you man you just not okay. like like other people why why are you happy all the time like is this fake are you wearing a mask and then you get to say like well let me let's go out to lunch and we can talk about it you know what i mean and and that's the best way to get your foot in the door because if they if you don't want it uh they're not it doesn't matter you could be the best salesman in the world you're not going to convince them to to go after it so yeah it feels very transactional sometimes like somebody has an agenda and you know like you want them to feel celebrated by you, not tolerated while you're, you're getting out your sales pitch to them. It's like, no, the, 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 you have to first believe in yourself. And when you're using, you don't have a good opinion. So they're like, oh, baby, I don't want to go out to lunch with you because I can't hide it anymore. Like you're going to learn about the real me. But when you're not judging them and lecturing them, it's like, I want to learn about the real you. It's okay. What do you think? Nobody's perfect. You got stuff. That's that's what relationships are meant to be, so that we can help each other. And mm -hmm. yeah, once that happens, it's much easier for them to listen to you with respect because you built a relationship. Um, mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, well, we have just a comment that building relationship builds that bridge to breakthrough. It's what we've been talking about the breakthrough through the so it is came to believe recovery's mission today and always now to try to get into this wall street era as much as we want to get into the people that are working for sean we want to be able to get our message out we want to be able to tell people that there is a a solution we want to be able to break the stigma we want to let them know that you can be successful and be sober and be clean and not only that you can be more successful mm -hmm. and happy joy sophia you can you can um be um I don't want to say in pride, but or a healthy level of pride, and you can be upstanding and a uh, successful and uh, uh, prosperous citizen, and be completely sober and be uh, completely accepted in the business world. But getting there and breaking that stigma, I think we're gonna we're gonna have a little bit of an uphill battle. I don't know, Peter, because I know that there's a stigma probably with a lot of money and the and the Wall Street that. If you can't hang with the partiers, like you were saying, or you can't hang with the lunch crew drinking, that you've somehow failed. Do you see that as a big barrier for us? Or do you think we no, got- No, I really don't. It might've been Good. 30, 40 years ago, it, you know, people would give you a look if you said you didn't drink and they don't anymore. And, you know, there's some people that have, if they're in a certain sales role, they get a budget that they have to spend every month. They have to take clients out. and. It, the bosses want the receipts to show that you did it, but you don't have to be party while you're there. But if, if you don't, if you're not realizing you have a problem, it could it could be leading to the problem because you're in that all the time. And like Sean said, you just don't you don't even think about the fact that this isn't normal for most people <laughs> to be out in bars and clubs all the time. So yeah, I, I think the uh, the appetite for people today, especially after COVID and all this lockdown, we have we are not built for isolation. So as people start to re-enter, they're open to go out to a meal or breakfast or coffee or whatever you do, and just talk about life. And you don't have to scratch very hard, you know, to find out there's hurt underneath the surface if they if they trust you and they should trust you because you don't have any other agenda. You're really trying to help them get something that you got basically for free like when you say right, right, it's basically right. for free you didn't go away for three months and get locked in a room somewhere you just heard good news and decided to believe it and and it worked and you're like oh my god i saved so much money i'm not buying rounds in the bar anymore <laughs> I got all this, it's, it's having babies in my wallet like where'd all this money come from oh that's right i'm sober <laughs> it's not it's actually more appealing when especially when I was using, when I would meet someone who was like really good at a craft and they, and they, and you'd be like, well, let's go and have a drink or let's go do this. And they'd be like, no, 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 that, that affects my craft. I'm all about, and, and I think in wall street money talks, you know? So like, if you're really, really good at your job and your performance is brought down because of drinking, uh, it's going to be really impressive to say, nah, I don't touch that because I'm actually better at what I do when I'm not on it. You know what I mean? That, that seems to be kind of a, a sexier thing nowadays. 
Well, it's a great point. And uh, you're, they, they normally would say, I'm just a social drinker. I don't have a problem with this. But the credibility factor is based on you being successful. So if you're, if you're saying that you found something that, they, that you think could help them and you're in a position in the org chart, you know, that you're a vice president, they're a junior vice president, that's really credible. So the, the more seasoned people that can reach down to the younger people and mentor them, and, and it's legit, right? I mean, somebody been on Wall Street 30 years can teach the younger person a lot of good lessons, including why addictions are, you know, are a counterfeit affection, but they can also give them good career advice. And I, I don't know, you, you guys may not know what, what big corporate America is like today, but there are so many policies that you have to follow and things you can and cannot say and you could make a very innocent comment and be fired for it and i don't know how that is going to end up but it's, right now it's very difficult so if you're watching today and any of this has sparked something in you if you're at work if you're somebody that's on wall street watching this today or you get this uh facebook feed if you have a family member who's on Wall Street, if you have a family member who's in Wisconsin, if you have a family members in Texas or the UK or anywhere in the world and you're watching this and you're saying, geez, you guys seem to have gotten this thing all together. What did you guys do? Come to one of our retreats, reach out to came to believe recovery.org, reach out to us, register for the retreat and come through the steps and the answer. There is a spiritual solution, guys. It is, it is underlined by Christian principles. We're going to give you some really practical tools and we're going to introduce you to a God that's powerful, that can actually deliver on promises and hand you a life like you've never known before. We're not talking about a church that we need you to go to or join. We don't have that as our agenda whatsoever. It's not a matter of that. It's a matter of getting you into a relationship with a power that can actually pull this addiction out of you and have the obsession removed we don't suffer with that today. Peter doesn't, Sean doesn't, and I don't suffer with uh, temptation at that level of where we're going to go uh, and we feel like we could even relapse. As long as we're following our 10, 11, and 12, and we're keeping spiritually fit like our program says, and like life says, we're good to go. So if any of this has any touched you at all, please, we really, 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 really just implore you to reach out to us because we have an answer and you can get it today. Peter, I have a question for you. And this has like a logistical question for us uh, mm -hmm. as, as a, you know, as a business kind of, as we're trying to reach into more places to uh, get our offering out to people that are addicted and hurting. How do you see us being able to get our message to like senior managers in organizations so that um, it could be offered to employees, at least as an option of something they could do how do you see us being able to do that? Well, I, I think I mentioned the affinity group idea earlier, right. right? So in New York, at least, once they opened the door to one affinity group, it was basically had to be open to everybody in order for them to be consistent with their, with their message. So there could be a faith-based recovery group potentially inside an organization. And Often we find out that many of the top leaders in the firm will come and speak there, which is a, a tacit endorsement that, that they're a believer themselves, right? That they came to believe, even though it's not hindering their career at the moment, they can relate to those people. So we had that happen. I don't, I'm not mentioning any company names right now, but the, that exact thing did happen. And some of the senior people came down once they knew that the door was open for them to be able to speak into this affinity group without that tagging them as somebody who, you know, was not in the right group or whatever you say, you know, like if you're going to open the door to one, you open the door to all and that's happening in corporate America. And, and, you know, you can't, you can't persecute faith-based decisions if, if they're, if you're allowing other people to make other types of decisions. And that's a nice, easy way to say it. It you know came to believe faith based. It's a good word. This is a faith based recovery group. Right. It's a based in a faith and a power that can restore us to sanity. It's what our program says, and we've right. all been restored to sanity. So that's good news, Peter. That we we and I don't know that it was always that way. That no. back years back, a, a group like ours could could have our message. Um, 
be accepted at all at a senior manager at a level in any corporate America. And I think it's changing today where there's an option. And, you know, money talks, like Sean said, and when they start, when we start talking about how much they're spending on rehabs and insurance costs and all, and we say, you know, a, a weekend retreat could solve people's problems at a fraction of the cost and they're back in your workforce on Monday after mm -hmm. the weekend changed and recovered and they never think that can happen until they see it and we see it every time right um, which is really something you should talk about because i think many people that have gone to the non-faith-based versions of the 12 step feel like it's something i have to do for the rest of my life you know every night for the rest of my life i'm going to be in one of these meetings and i don't mean to to criticize that if it's working for people but they don't even know there's another option it's 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 you're so right you know why do we go to meetings Sean? to spread the message of alcoholics anonymous to the still suffering addict it's just that simple we're in meetings now to do our 12 step when we go i don't go to a meeting because i need it to stay sober myself even though helping others ensures our sobriety ensures our freedom it continues the promises coming through in our lives um well, something you said before was really key. You don't obsess about it anymore. And, and it, right. when you're in an obsession, it's hard to imagine that you could ever live without it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like you, the desire to want to do it diminishes. And it's hard to believe that that could be the case when you, you know, like I remember in high school, sticking my finger in an ashtray, hoping there'd be a roach of a, of right. a <laughs> joint, you know, and I could find three or four of them and try to make one more. Like that is just embarrassingly bad behavior, you know, like really you've, you've fallen to this level that, that, I mean, we could all say worse things we did, but like, like that you're not in control. Like you can be, you really can. You don't have to be obsessed like that, but you've been obsessed so long. You don't even realize there's another reality out there. And, and guys, it doesn't matter where you are in your addiction and what place you are in your life. I came in at 42 years old and ended up going back to college and getting a master's degree and doing things like learning how to play guitar that you see behind me and, and other things that I've done in my life. And Peter's done some things in, in, in his point in his life. And Sean has done things in his life that we've gotten back. It's never too late. If you think you can't get your life back or there's no life for you, it's a lie. Come, hear the message, start your life. You were put on this earth to do something. And if you don't do it, no one else will. Everyone is valuable. Everyone is worth it. Everyone is here for a purpose don't think that you're not valuable it's not true everybody here has something that they can contribute and we need it the world needs you and we need you healthy and free and you'll have a wonderful fellowship believe me you're not going to be lonely you're going to turn up over one set of friends that were in that were really hurting you to a group of people that just love on you all the time and are, are looking out only for your best interests so don't think you're going to be away give be um lonely which is what i thought uh uh i'm just reading some things uh uh all right let's do our giveaway before we run out of time we're starting to run out of time we have so many questions today peter we might have to have you come back on if First you're going to come back on for you because i got questions we're not going to get to them all we'll try to get to them i might forward them to you peter we can do them in writing to these people Sure. But there's some questions we're probably not going to get to, but let's give away the end addiction shirt today. Uh, so Sarah's going to grab a random audience member and we'll send you that end addiction shirt today. Um, let's see if we can take uh, one more question. Uh, this is from uh, one of our viewers asks, uh, how do we encourage, I can answer this a little, and Sean, maybe this is a good one for you too. How do we encourage people who do not have any belief in anything? We meet that a lot. How do we encourage someone without a belief in anything when they, they hear this message? They're on this right now saying, they hear Peter say faith based. They talk, hear me talk about Christian principles underneath and they have this idea they have to believe a certain way. How would you answer that? Encouragement for me truly is a lifestyle. There's this book I read called The Culture of Empowerment. Um, it's by Steve Backland. I'll say it again, The Culture of Empowerment. And really, it's one of the best gifts you can give back to, to, to society and, and to community because to your communities because people don't usually get encouragement. It's not a normal thing, but 
but it, it's free for us to give. And, and that's just where I start. It's, it's just to make it a lifestyle for myself to, to build up the people around me because it's just a, such a simple little gift. And they, nev- they, they may not see it. You may be the only person in their day or week or month that said anything that could lift them up. And it doesn't have to be huge. You don't, it doesn't have to be revelatory. It just has to be something simple. Like, Hey, you know, you're, you're doing a great job and I, I really like being around you. And I look forward to our relationship getting better or, or anything, you know, that's just where you start. You can't start at the big stuff. Like, like if I just walked up to someone and, and was like, I can really tell you're going to have a deep relationship with God. Cause you're amazing. That one's just going to go over their head. But if I'm like, you know what? I see a little bit of me and you, and I, I really like that. You're going to do great, man. You're going to do some big things or, or anything like that. You know, just anything to get under them, push that negativity off to the side and say something positive because it may be the only positive thing they hear all day. Right from the beginning. And that's a person with no faith at all could start believing then. Yeah, I would completely agree. I, I, I was thinking about, I know Steve Backlund too. I endorse his work. Great stuff. So, um, I can remember being at uh, one of the bigger firms and when people make a lot of money that are on Wall Street, they can get an a, a, like a coating of arrogance and they don't even realize it, but it's rewarded. So they'll be le- leaving the office at seven o'clock at night and there'll be the, the crew that comes in to clean the office. And often in our area, that's a Hispanic crew and they're you know, maybe older women that, you know, pushing the, the stuff around and cleaning and these guys would often just walk right past them and forget that that's a human being with a name and it's somebody's mother and or daughter or whatever. And you just find things that happen spontaneously just by you walking out what you believe. They'll come alongside you and say, oh, I didn't even think of that, right? So one year we raised money from the people on the floor and put it in an envelope, just like 10 bucks, 20 bucks cash for Christmas. And we asked the lady who was the head of the crew to come in to the office and she was nervous. So we're talking to her and we say, Hey, we just want you to know that we took up a collection for you guys for Christmas, for your team. And and we wanted you to have a Merry Christmas. And we handed her this cash, probably a couple hundred dollars. She burst out crying. Like, cause she thought she was in trouble. She thought she was being pulled into the office cause she did something wrong. Never expected somebody to be generous and kind and always kind of didn't like the fact that she wasn't even being treated like a human being often, but the wealthier, you know, people that are too busy to notice, they weren't even treat her. And, and I remember the effect that that had on the other person that was with me. So they might not believe in faith, let's say organized religion, but everybody believes something when they get up in the morning, it might not be an organized plan like that, but you know, we all act like we believe, you know, we, we live our lives in a way that we believe. So that's all. Like when you do it out in the workforce, it becomes tangible. A lot of other examples I could give, but uh, I, I realize we're probably getting short on time. We're getting short on time, but that is great. Just simple kindness, I think. And my friend Dale Barker in Florida always says, let it look good on you. And if yeah. you let it look good on you, and we're all program of attraction, even though Clarence said it's a program of of, uh, what does he say, not attraction, of promotion. We do have to get out there and tell people about it so that they know um, that there is a solution. Um, Mike Gregori won the shirt. Mike, you won the addiction shirt. So send your um, size and your address to Sarah and she'll send it to you. Um, well, this has been a great discussion today. I mean, again, we got five minutes. We could keep going on. I know we could talk about this for the next hour and a half. Well, there was something, if you have a minute, I'll, I'll sure. the brief version. So another one of those stories that you watch, and there's a lot of layers to it. So there's a coach at a faith-based uh, high school in Texas, football coach, and every year they play the team that's at the local state penitentiary for youth. So the youth prison. And, and inside the prison, one of the rewards for the guys is they can play on the football team as long as they behave. And they all want to do that, right? So they want to just get out and go play a game under the lights, even though they don't have a lot of people on the team. So the coach sends out, the coach of the high school sends out an email to the parents that said, would you be willing this year for half of you to go to the other side and cheer for the kids from the prison? 
and half stay here. And they've never had this happen. So the kids come running out of the locker room and there's all these people in the stands cheering for them. And they're looking into the camera when they're being interviewed. Like, we didn't know what the heck. We thought they all made a mistake and went on the wrong side. But they were really cheering for these kids. And it's hard to watch it without a tear coming to your eye. Like, that's all they needed was, like you were saying, so just a little bit of encouragement from somebody. Because those parents really wanted that team to win. It wasn't like, you know, they were really cheering for, the, for, for these kids. They didn't win, but it didn't matter. They were interviewing the kids that were in the prison, and they said, man, never never had anybody cheer for me before. Wow. Didn't know what that was like. I know. I'll send it to you. It, it, it's a YouTube awesome. video. It really is. But again, it's like you don't have to say a word. You just let somebody experience it, and it's like, oh, wow, that's a different way to live. I never would have thought of that. Wow. That is a powerful story. We're getting a lot of questions about the, the program uh, for all sorts of addictions and for anybody. So I want to make a comment on that, that came to believe recovery, the 12 steps were always meant to be a solution for any kind of brokenness that you have in your life. It wasn't meant just for addiction. And uh, while I, some of us have the allergy, we call it, or the genetic disposition for a substance that we get addicted to, there's a powerlessness that, that anyone can have over whatever behavior it is that has them in brokenness. And that powerlessness is has the same solution that we have when we have the allergy or the genetic substance um, addiction. So you don't have to have the substance addiction to suffer from the same thinking that leads to a bad behavior that has the same solution in our steps, the same solution, the same power that we have that pulled us out of our substance addiction can pull you out of any other type of bad behavior, any other addiction. So Definitely. absolutely, the Definitely. 12 steps as it was um, uh, meant back in the 30s was to provide relief from brokenness, from anything that has you in bondage. The God, the power that we take on in step three, the living God comes into our hearts and gives us that power to be broken free of whatever it is that that has you in bondage so absolutely it's for all again if you're if you're interested uh we have a, a virtual retreat coming up next weekend um and then one a month after that uh we'd love to have the opportunity to share the message of recovery with anyone who needs it please spread the word to anyone that you know um get us get in contact with us and we can help um get that message to you so I want to thank Peter for being with us this uh, Friday afternoon. He's a busy well, man. He took his time out to come. Uh, thanks. Even, for with, with, even with no intro music, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Next time. I'm have sorry, Peter. I really, I really yeah. am sorry about that. Straighten them out. Yeah. I'm trying. Really. I really am. I really am trying. He always has to straighten me out. He's got me wearing glasses like his. This is all the Sean Higgins influence. There you go. The, glasses the hair is like nice. His in the hair, you know, I, it's got me hip. There really is a question that I think needs to be answered that we didn't get to, and that's like, what color glitter are you, Tom? Mm -hmm. what color glitter am I? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm probably shiny bright blue, why? <laughs> I, I, I just feel like that the world needed to know. I was gonna say gold, cause you're like first place uh, in my board. I got or platinum, you know, that's supposed to be even better. Well, I'm not flat. I, I wouldn't go that far, but gold was good. <laughs> anyway, and, well, let's get to your head. Yeah. All right, guys. So, um, uh, Sean, why don't you take us out as we're reaching our the top of the hour? And and everybody, uh, again, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week, next Friday. Go ahead, Sean. Okay. Here we go. You. You out there right now listening to us who are just sitting there and you're like, man, I, I really, you know who I'm talking about. You, right now when I point at you, you, you know I'm talking to you. Don't live another day in the, in the spot that you're in and the misery that you're in. Let that all get behind you. You know, you can be one of those broken people that becomes healed and then a healed, people that become, a healed person that becomes powerful. So we just want to say today for the rest of you out there, thanks for viewing, thanks for tuning in. And, and, and we want to watch you jump from the level you're at to the next level. So don't 
don't leave live another day in that garbage even if it's just in the middle in the mundane go check out came to believe recovery.org get involved get get this stuff behind you get some resources but hit that like button hit that share button drop your name in the comments give us a smiley face if you liked us give us a don't do anything if you didn't like us just go on to the next page forget about us but we love you all have a wonderful day goodbye have a great weekend everybody take care